Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for speaking to us when you were under absolutely no obligation to do so. And we benefit daily from our ability to hear from you. Uh, Not only that, God, but you've given us Bibles in our own languages, um, in our in, in English, men who shed their blood and whom you use over the centuries, God, to give us written copies of your word in abundance, even. God, we just owe you so much gratitude. Uh, these things are so easy to overlook, and yet you are worthy of, of great praise because of them. God, you uh, tell us that your word sanctifies, it enlightens our eyes. It is a light and a lamp. We don't know where we're going without it. And so I pray that you would illuminate our understanding this morning, that as we plan ourselves in your word for the next hour, that you would be pleased to open our eyes so that we might behold wondrous things from your law. We ask all of these things, knowing that we do not deserve such privileges, but only on the character, the reputation of Christ alone can we come in boldness asking for these things. And so we do just that now. In Christ's name, amen. In his book titled Woke Church, author and pastor Eric Mason laments the church's lack of influence regarding race and justice-related issues. He recounts watching an interview between Oprah and the iconic rap star Jay-Z in which Jay-Z explained how hip-hop had more impact on race relations than any figure or entity except for Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. Here is what in that section Eric Mason goes on to say about that interview between Jay-Z and Oprah. Jay-Z talked about how whites and blacks can come together in the clubs even though they might not get together outside the club. They gather around this musical and cultural form and find solace in being able to talk about things they wouldn't normally talk about. Hip-hop helped them to start talking with one another and even to begin building relationships. Why was I convicted by that? Because a musical cultural form that's only about 40 years old should not have more impact than the church, which has existed for thousands of years. We should be the main communicator about challenges that happen in our country on race and justice. We should be the first place that people look to for answers. We should be the ones presenting a clear, viable model of the hope that lies within us. This is pretty typical thinking in our day to think that the church is needing to catch up to the good works that are already happening in the world. The thought seems to be, well, the world is excelling in these noble pursuits. And so if only the church would hurry up and start doing those same things. The examples of this kind of this kind of thinking could be multiplied. For example, some years ago during the NBA playoffs, uh, people were calling attention to one successful team vying for the championship spot that they had a vast amount of diversity on their team. In the organization, uh, this sports team apparently had something like 12 different nations represented within the organization. And so, as can you can guess, uh, it wasn't long before Christians started to uh, complain that the church should look at that team and take note. Uh, Look at the success that they're accomplishing with such diversity. Why can't the church be more like that? The church should look at that sports team and learn a thing or two. 
And so in this and many other instances, the church is treated as if it should be taking her moral cues from some example out there in the world. This thinking is all too common in our day. It misses the very fact that good works are not, cannot, and never have been practiced by unbelieving haters of God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, as Paul says in Romans 8.8. 8. On the contrary, the ones, the only ones who have ever been pleasing to God are those whom God has saved. I want to show us this this morning at length. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Turn, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. In this passage, we will see that the church does not need to catch up when it comes to good works. Verse 8 in Ephesians 2 explains why what God has done for us, according to the preceding verse, shows the surpassing riches of God's grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 explains why that surpassing riches, the surpassing riches of God's grace and kindness are displayed. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The way that God saves men, according to verse 8, that is, by grace and through faith, that act of salvation on God's part to save in that particular way by grace alone, through faith alone, will put the surpassing riches of God's kindness in Jesus Christ on display for all of eternity. Verse 7 says, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. That's the point. And this will allow every single ounce of self-focused praise to be undone, to be disallowed, according to verse 9. When salvation is accomplished by grace alone, through faith alone, and it not being a result of works, the result is that no one could possibly boast, not in themselves, only in God. This is why verse 10 goes on to explain why God saving us in this way bars boasting. That's what verse 10 does. It explains why all human boasting is barred before God. For we, verse 10 says, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works those good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. To God be the glory for our good works. That's the point of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. To God alone be the glory for our good works. That's what this passage is telling us. This passage wonderfully explains why our good works redound to the glory of God and why, because of this, what God is doing in this current age, he is doing through the church. This passage lays out seven reasons why, essentially, our good works terminate at the glory of God. To God alone be the glory for our good works. Just to walk through verse 10, the first reason this is the case is because of his creative power. Because of his creative power, it is because of God's creative power at work 
that God receives all the glory for our good works. Verse 10, we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus. Whenever God's creative ability is in view, some specific characteristics of God himself, some specific attributes of God, you can count to be implied. The work that God did, as described here, he did powerfully, wisely, independently, sovereignly, and intentionally. Let me show you this in verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship. Or you could translate this, we are a work of his, of God's. That word that gets translated, at least in the New American Standard Bible, workmanship, that comes from the same root word that we find in Genesis 1 in verb form. In the beginning, God created. Created, workmanship, this word comes from the same uh, Greek root. When the Greek speakers translated the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language, they use the word that shares a root with what gets translated workmanship. And so what God has done for us in Christ by virtue of saving us apart from works, when he has uh, created or made us a work, the same power that was on display in him doing that is the same power that was on display when he created the world. The same God puts the same power on display for two different reasons. In Genesis 1, to create all of creation. Here in Ephesians 2, to uniquely and specially create believers in Christ Jesus who are saved from his wrath for his glory. As you heard a few weeks ago when Smed preached on uh, why Genesis matters, we need a redeemer who has creative power and a creator who has redemptive purpose. This is what's on display here, that kind of power. The next word that we come to in this passage, we are his workmanship or a work of his created. There's another created type word. We are a work created. This is a different created word. Uh, even in the Greek, it's a different, uh, different word. It's the same word that we find in Psalm 51 when David says, create in me a clean heart. When he pleads with God for a right heart, a sanctified heart, one that is truly repentant, David recognized that that had to be created in him. He didn't possess the power or the ability or the skill to produce that in himself, and so God had to create it. This is the same uh, word in the Greek, uh, in that translation of the Hebrew scriptures in Psalm 51 that we find here in Ephesians 2. And so the point is, uh, is, is easy to understand here. God's creative power, his creative genius is on display, not only in his ability to create things in creation, but to recreate things in, in man, a renewed heart, a new nature. It would be a, a fair translation of this verse, I suppose, just with all of the created language, you could translate this for we are a work of his who were worked in Christ Jesus for good works. We are a work of his work, who were worked in Christ Jesus for good works. God's creative power on display to produce good works in us. Not only was uh, this work that God did did he do powerfully, but also wisely. That's always on 
uh, display when God's creative uh, or creativity is at work, that he does this in wisdom. Just think about the wisdom that it takes for him as the creator to have a purpose in mind. We've already seen that in verse 7, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then to accomplish that one ultimate great end, he wisely creates or works something that accomplishes that. He gives a new nature to the sinner, one that believes and that responds to the faith that he himself gives as a gift. And when that renewed person is saved, this verse 9 removes all boasting. So to have that one great end in mind and then come up as the creator with a way to accomplish that and then see to it that what you're doing in your created work actually accomplishes the intended end, that takes a tremendous amount of wisdom. You have to have seen the beginning or the end all the way from the beginning when you start the created creation work. And God did just that. His wisdom followed his own creative plan that perfectly accomplishes what he intended from the very start. This work that God did, he did not only powerfully and wisely, but also independently. Just notice in verse 10 again, whose workmanship are we? We are his workmanship, not his and, but his alone. No one else participated in this work with God. No one else made the Christian a work of God except God himself. You didn't participate. You didn't help God. He didn't ask our opinion. He did it on his own. Therefore, he did it independently. He also did this sovereignly. He didn't ask us. He didn't ask anyone else if he could have permission to do this created work. Just like he asked no one else at the beginning when he created all things, when he chose to recreate those who believe, neither did he ask anyone's opinion. The creator never solicited his creation's permission to create them. And finally, this created work, this creation work was done intentionally. It was done intentionally. God's work is particular. It's not random. Therefore, when he made you in Christ, he did it on purpose. Just consider how this says, for we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. Just don't skip the significance of the pronoun there. We, who does Paul have in mind? Well, according to verse 1 in chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, is writing to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul has himself in mind in this we, and he has in mind the faithful called out ones of God who are in Ephesus, particular people. He would have known them well. And so he has particular people in mind, at least some of them, who are included in this church that finds themselves at Ephesus. So the work is particular, and it includes those particular people. If God has created you, not just naturally, but recreated you, made you alive in Christ so that you are no longer dead in your trespasses and sins, if God has done that to you, Christian, then he was intentional, not random. Your creation in Christ was not an accident. And so you are a work of God if you are a Christian. And so you, believer, are the very evidence of God's creativity in the world because you have his creative fingerprints all over you in salvation. 
in your body at the beginning of your life and now in your soul since you have new life. God's creativity is evident in you. To God be the glory for our good work secondarily because of his personal kindness. Because of his personal kindness. God's personal kindness in verse 10 is on display currently and corporately. And that brings us back to that phrase we already looked at. We are. For we are. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So that that very act is an act of kindness. We've already said that it did not include us. We didn't help God. We assisted him in no way possible. And so this that has happened to us, this created work that has happened to us, is purely a gift of God. It's a part of the salvation package that comes to us when God saved us. And so this is a gift, God's personal kindness, his grace to us. And this is both displayed currently and corporately. Why do I say that? It's displayed currently simply because the verb are is current. That is, right now, this is on display We are his workmanship. And, again, the we is significant. Paul is not just, he didn't say I, he didn't say you, he said we. He has in mind himself as the apostle and the entire church. So the church corporately, currently, puts on display God's personal kindness. So right now, We, Grace Bible Church, are evidence of God's undeserved, tremendous, lavish kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is, there's a a helpful implication to consider from this. Do you think not only of yourself, when you think of Everything that God has done in salvation. Do you think not only of yourself, but do you think of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you, in conflict, perhaps, uh, with a spouse, do you call this to mind? That my sometimes difficult wife is still proof, even in those moments, of God's kindness. Or my hard-headed husband even in those moments, is still evidence of God's kindness on display. We would do well to call those kinds of things to mind. That would help temper us in our responses, make us more patient, more willing to bear with one another. Because even in those moments, at our worst, still, as believers, members of the household of God, we still are evidence of God's kindness because we are his workmanship. Thirdly, to God be alone, to God be the glory for our good works because of our inseparable union, our inseparable union. Just notice the next phrase, for we are his workmanship who were created in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. A few years ago, we adopted our four-year-old son, Jonah. He was not created in Emily's womb like our other four. He was formed in his birth mom. And for that reason, and even only that reason, he has an inseparable connection to his birth mom. No one can change that can't be altered by him, by us, by the state, by virtue of him being created in her, he has an inseparable connection to that woman. The same is true with us by virtue of being created in Christ. We will always be in some way inseparably connected to Christ Jesus. And so just like a child who is formed in his mother's womb will always have something in common with that woman in some way, 
Even so, the Christian must be like Jesus because we were created in him. We will bear a resemblance to God's son. Bound up in those words there, Christ and Jesus, there's a lot of ideas bound up in those two names. But just consider Christ, Messiah, he was the king. He was the king of Israel, preeminently so. This is one of his uh, chief attributes, if you will, the role that he would play. He was king. He ruled the nations. And one day that would become tangible by all that God had prophesied about him, about the coming Messiah. He was the Lord who sits at Yahweh's right hand one day to come and rule in a tangible kingdom on earth. And so the union that's being put front and center here by Paul, when he calls to mind God's creative activity for us in salvation, is that we are united to our king. Not second-class citizens, but united to the very king himself as citizens of his kingdom. And the name Jesus, meaning Yahweh saves, means that this inseparable union is not only to Christ as king, but Christ as savior. This is why you can't be unsaved, Christian. You have an inseparable connection to the one who saves. And this one, this king who is savior, is also called the son. Uh, Thinking of Psalm 2, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. A call to worship the king who is the ruler, who is the appointed son of God. We are attached to God's son and by virtue of being united to God's son, are also sons, lowercase s, as well. These are marvelous truths in a short span being implied and uh, Paul's directing our attention here. Fourthly, the fourth reason that this glory belongs to God alone because of our good works is because of his good purpose His good purpose, you see that in the phrase, uh, the next phrase, for good works, for good works. This is God's intention for us in creating us as a work in Christ Jesus. It was for the sake of good works. Notice in, in this passage that is saturated with God's own glory, God's own attributes being forever displayed as the ultimate goal. We saw that in verse 7, in verse 8, that's why he does it apart from men. In verse 9, he says that's why no one will be able to boast. So God alone gets the praise. God alone gets the credit and worship. Well, if that's the goal, then how can he also say in the same breath that the goal of this created work that God did was for, is for, good works. These thoughts that we were created for God's glory and for good works do not need to be reconciled because they are not at odds. Good works, all good works that are truly good done by the Christian terminates at the glory of God. The way God receives glory is by doing this very thing and then putting us into work to labor to showcase his kindness to us. Every good work, whether it's at the thought level, at the level of your motivations, at the level of your words or deeds, every single one of them can be attributed to God's grace to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be able to do them. How do we know that? Well, it was 
God himself, who, according to verse 10, even prepared them beforehand for us. Even at the level of preparation, that even was accomplished by God, which is the fifth reason why glory belongs to God alone for our good works, because of his preordained preparation. His preordained preparation. These good works, every single one of them that has ever been performed by every believer throughout all time, and particularly in the church, these good works are walked in by the Christian because God prepared them. God paved the way. He was the one who ordained them. And he is the one ultimately who in time causes them to happen. Do you remember Philippians 2? Verse 13. When Paul calls the Philippians to obey, to continue obeying as they always have, not only in his presence, but also and much more even in his absence. He calls them in verse 12 to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And he says the reason that they must do this, do good works from a good disposition, is because it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He was the one who determined the works and in time ensures that they happen. So to God alone be the glory for our good works. God has thought of our entire salvation, including all of our sanctification, from start to finish. What it took to bring you to Christ, what it takes to make you see the end and finish the race, and on into eternity. God has determined all of those things and fulfills them himself. Our job in this life is just to follow the path laid for us so that we step exactly where he has ordained. That's our job, to walk right where God has ordained for us to walk. We don't have the privilege of knowing what he has ordained, that's good because we would not strive as we ought to. Our job is to just strive and obey and whatever he accomplishes in us, we can look back in hindsight and say that is what he has ordained. Finally, number six, the sixth reason why to God be the glory for our good works is because of our obedient practice. Because of our obedient practice. That's what's in view when he says that we would walk in them so that we would walk in them. And that's the goal. It's interesting to to note that he uses the term walk there after describing everything that God has done and nothing that we have done, he puts before us what is the expectation that we would walk in them. And just in the term walk, you would think after God has done so much for us, what great feat do we need to accomplish for him? Just walk. That's it. That's sufficient. That's enough to put God's marvelous glory and grace on display. And so the simplicity of our obedient practice, as well as the regularity of our obedient practice, are both in view by using that term walk. Now that God has remade you, Christian, good works are, in a sense, as simple as walking. Just put one foot in front of the other and walk in the obedience that God has for you. And walking, again, also indicates this regularity. Hardly anything was more common 
than walking in Paul's day. Therefore, this shows us what ought to be our pattern of life. That walking indicates the pattern of life. Let me remind you, this was not always possible for you. Right? You might be thinking, man, walking sound or feels in this season of life so hard in a particular area of obedience. Walking faithfully, I barely feel like I'm doing that. Maybe I'm crawling sometimes. Even if that's the case, even if, even if it feels that way, just go a few verses back and recognize how far apart, how far different, even your walking on your worst day is from where you used to be. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Where you used to be, Christian, was dead in your trespasses and sins. Not created, not a work work in Christ Jesus. You were not in Christ Jesus. You were in trespasses and sins in which you did formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. If God is at work in you at all, to walk at all in obedience, then that is far better than being dead and walking according to the course of this world, walking according to the prince of the power of the air. Even in our mixed condition, there is so much glory for God to be had in us. Not enough to stay there and be content with our current level of, of obedience now that we know, oh, great, even in my mixed condition, on my worst day, there's still some semblance of glory that God can get out of me. I'm okay with that. No, press on. Press on. Increase in good works. Stir up one another to love and good deeds. This passage is helpful to remind us the good works that are in view here, these belong only to those in whom Christ is working, in whom God has done this incredible work of salvation. The world does not have good works. The world doesn't have good works because the world doesn't have a new nature to perform them. So no, we cannot look to the unbelieving world for moral help in pleasing God. It is impossible. Since the world, or excuse me, since the church is the only body on earth that can do God-honoring good works, then here are some things to take away from that reality. For starters, don't buy the lie being sold by the social justice movement that the church should be doing the world's works in order to please God. That's a lie. The good works, so-called, that the church is being called to by the social justice movement, the non-governmental organizations, the non-profit organizations, they're doing fine accomplishing those things without the church's help. The soup kitchens, cleaning up city streets, those things aren't inherently wrong or bad in and of themselves, but they're just not the different or unique good works that the church can perform. We have something that the world doesn't have. We have an actual message to proclaim, a message that changes souls. We have preaching. We have equipping. We have the ministry of the word that the world wants nothing to do with. So while they are pursuing some cultural form of justice, what they're calling justice and equality, 
the church has a unique opportunity to do what only the church can do, which is preach the gospel, see lives transformed, disciple nations, teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. So if you have to pick a priority, which we all do, then make that your priority. Put your best energies there. And yes, don't neglect to do good works as you prioritize preaching everywhere you go. This was the model throughout the book of Acts. Nowhere in Scripture, in the New Testament, nowhere particularly in the book of Acts that records so much of the church's busyness and activities in narrative form, do you see the church pursuing social justice endeavors that are being encouraged in our day. And so don't make that your aim. Don't obligate this church to pursue those things. Don't find fault in the model of ministry happening here because that's not being pursued. To find fault even here at Grace Bible Church for not pursuing those things, and some have, that would also impugn the model of the very first church. They didn't do those things either. Moreover, if you're not going to give your attention to those things as a model of ministry, then that also calls us to participate in what God is doing in the church uniquely. What is God doing in the church? Join, participate, labor to the point of exhaustion, in doing those things. What do I have in mind? Things like discipling, things like giving, things like praying, things like serving. What about discipling? Do you prioritize discipling, making disciples? Do you prioritize being discipled? So that of all the things you could give your time to, preeminent among those things is making sure that whatever weaknesses I have in my life that I need help with, I'm finding someone mature than me. A pastor doesn't have to be a pastor. An older man, an older woman, if I see a younger man or a younger woman exemplary in this area of life, go to them, let them disciple you. Are you prioritizing discipleship? And if you are prioritizing being discipled, then are you prioritizing discipling others? Not just grabbing coffee together and catching up. That's great. Happens plenty. I'm sure as Matt Kelso can attest, it happens quite a bit. But even if you, that's the format for the meeting, are you prioritizing discipleship by being intentional about coming alongside each other and sharpening weaknesses. If you see a weakness in someone, in your small group, not talking about one sin, one time, but you see a, a weakness perhaps in marriage, the marriage relationship, in parenting, do you intentionally come alongside those people and in a non-offensive, non-threatening way say, hey, would love to invite you over and host you or go grab coffee. Would you mind if I point out a weakness that I see in your life? I can remember years ago, uh, John McCoy and I uh, met every other week or so by phone, and he did that very thing because he loves me, and he said, there's a pattern that I see in the way you treat this particular person. Can I point that out? No? Yes? Okay. Let me have it. And, and I'm so thankful that you did, John. We should be in, in a habit of doing that. That's discipleship. And that strengthens the church. That's the unique work that the church can be doing and so we must devote ourselves to that. Older ladies in our church, 
who have more time than a young mom managing children? Do you prioritize discipleship by drawing near to those young wives, young moms, and teaching them, training them to do what Titus 2 puts in front of you? Train the women, the young women, to be workers at home, lovers of their husband, lovers of children, sensible, etc. And if you feel like, ah, I know I'm an older woman, but I'm not there yet. I'm not ready to step into someone's life and take spiritual responsibility for them. I still need help. Then what are you doing to get there? We need you to get there. We need you to be there and strengthen the rest of us so that all the younger people from the women in your small group to the seminary students in TES, their homes are strengthened and that for future generations, Grace Bible Church is around for a long time, holding to sound doctrine and constantly abounding in godliness. We need that from you. And older men, the same, the same is true for you. Those uh, very virtues, <clears throat> by the way, that the world is so adamant that it must see that the church isn't helping in, things like justice, righteousness, equity. Those things actually are happening in sound churches. <laughs> they are happening. They're just not the version of justice, righteousness, equity that the world wants. And so the problem isn't what God has commissioned his church to do. The problem is that the world has rejected those good works, wants nothing to do with them, and is insisting that the church do something other than what God has called her to. And too many Christians have jumped on that bandwagon and aided the church in calling Christ's bride to things that her Lord doesn't call her to do. No man would accept that in his own home, calling if a man came into his house, demanded that his wife submit to things that he didn't require of his wife, you would get that, you would run that guy out of your house. And yet, plenty of people are doing that in God's household. Things like help for the poor, help for the sick, help for the weak, the adoption of orphans, hospitality to strangers, the giving freely of worldly goods to others, that happens in the church all the time. Sound churches all around the world practice those things. That's not satisfactory for the world. That's not going to pass the social justice test. And so just don't buy into it. Don't cave to that pressure. The other thing that this text implies for us, if good works have been uniquely prepared for the church to walk in, then one of those good works must include evangelism. It must include evangelism. And so if there's something you can do to change the world, then it's at least that. Every Christian can accomplish that, can participate in that can seek to change the world by sowing the word. You want to change the world? You want to change people's lives? You want to change the future, the trajectory of somebody's life who needs help? Preach the gospel. Don't just be content to obey the gospel in front of them. As necessary as that is, as useful and good as that is to a Christian's testimony and to God being glorified in the world, it certainly isn't sufficient to save anybody. No one's been saved by you being nice to them. That's not how you came. That's not how I came. We heard the word. We heard the truth preached to us. Someone said in some way, shape, shape or form, boldly or maybe even timidly, you're a sinner. <laughs> You're in trouble with God. There's wrath to pay. It's coming. You must repent and trust yourself to Christ alone for salvation. He was substituted for you under God's wrath if you believe the gospel. If you stop trusting your own goodness, 
and trust in the goodness of God alone, you will be saved. You don't have anything to contribute. You don't have to do anything. Just believe. And that was an act of compassion when we heard that message from whomever we heard it from. And what did God do? What we've been reading. He created us in Christ Jesus. He gave us new life. Verse 4 of Ephesians 2, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. He did that. Are you eager to see that be done for others? You must open your mouth and articulate the gospel for them. You must, with the full authority of God, command them, friend, I love you. You must repent. There's blessing in repentance. Come know the goodness of God. Come become a part of his household, and you will see how good it is. And then finally, just one more implication to take from this. Because good works have been uniquely prepared for the church, then aim at God's target for good works. Aim at God's target for good works, which is the glory of God. You should do this on purpose. Not just in the back of your mind, no, okay, I'm going to obey God, and yeah, he'll get glory some way. Well, yes, that's true, and we should know that. We should have that in the back of our mind, but also add to it intentionality. There's this circumstance there's this circumstance that I find myself in by God's foreordination, by his providence. This is where I find myself in this conflict or having to live with this person or having to work for this boss or work alongside this difficult coworker, whatever it is, be intentional, plan. How am I going to show, showcase God's patience? How am I going to showcase God's kindness in this season of life? How am I going to prove, perhaps for someone who doesn't even know, that God is incredibly kind? What am I going to do to make that abundantly clear through, my, through me? If I get the opportunity through these good works, what would I say to a person who asked why I act this way? Be intentional and give thought to those things. And in that way, knowing that God has meticulously prepared good works for you to walk in for the sake of being glorified, then you can step into those very situations more prepared to bring him glory. And then you can encourage others along the way to join you. God's church is unique. God's church is unique because God has made her unique. He has perfectly suited the church and uniquely gifted the church to bring him maximum glory. And so there is no substitute for the church, no program, no organization, no person that can accomplish what God is accomplishing in his church. The church of God, one author said, raised above the human system of the superstitious and the incredulous alike is the assembly of those who by a living faith are partakers of the righteousness of Christ and of the new life of which the Holy Spirit is the creator, of those in whom selfishness is vanquished and who give themselves up to the Savior to achieve with their brethren the conquest of the world. Such is the true church of God, very different it will be seen from all those invented by man. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for, of your own accord, uh, making this unique 
body and even ensuring that the gospel made its way all the way to Tempe, Arizona, so that we find ourselves where we do today. Perfectly placed, uniquely positioned to bring you glory that we had no interest in, that we were opposed to before you saved us. What kindness. I pray that you would cause us to be humble before these truths, that you would make us bold with your truth to run hard in our labors for your church and with the gospel, always having your honor at the forefront of our minds. And only you can make that possible where it's lacking. Only you can make someone love these things. And so we pray you would do that tremendous work in us. We ask all these things in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.